gospel for today comes from Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 23, and then it stretches all the way to chapter 3, verse 6. It's found on page 28 in your New Testament if you'd like to follow along. Hear the good news for this day. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain field, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether Jesus would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then Jesus said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him. How to destroy Jesus. This is our good news for this day. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator, and our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A friend of mine used to wear this shirt all the time. Legalism rules. The first time I saw it, it broke my brain. And then I stared at it for longer, and my brain broke even more. Legalism is basically excessively following rules. Following the letter of the law to the extreme. Certain religions are considered more legalistic. You have to follow this rule, and 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 others are not so strict. Stare... Okay. <laughs> Staring at that shirt, legalism rules, I got lost in all the possible things that it could be saying. Legalism rules as in it controls our lives like a king in charge, ruling us. Legalism rules as in it's cool, perhaps sar sarcasm. Legalism rules. Legalism rules as in it's only rules rules to follow, and nothing more. A poorly formed sentence that should have said, legalism is rules, but t-shirts are expensive to make, you can only have so much <laughs> Legalism rules as it is the power in charge of our lives now. Perhaps the pervasive religious thought that's in control is legalistic. People that follow legalism are in charge. For us today, that last meaning is perhaps the most useful because that's what Jesus was confronting. A shift in the religious belief of Jesus' day toward a more legalistic, rule-following way. There was rule after rule after rule. A lot of times we make Jesus out to be working to bring down Judaism. Or we read that what he said was truly shocking to Judaism, but in fact, what Jesus says in these passages from Mark are not even new to Judaism. It was just shocking to the people in charge of Judaism in that day. It's kind of like how, as we see religion in this country, perhaps swing more conservative or more progressive, depending on politicians and televangelists and books that are popular. Jesus watched as his faith was being turned into something it was not. 
a religion that was trapping its followers in something that was never intended. Jesus tells that story that we heard from our first reading of 1 Samuel about David eating holy bread. It's bread that should have only been consumed by God, where God breathes in the aroma, or by priests who ate it on behalf of God, lucky priests. But in that story, in Samuel, this bread comes to serve a higher function than a religious one. It meets the needs of hunger. And that might be a weird thing for a pastor to say, that there's higher needs than religious ones. But I want to tell you about a story. This last Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter during Holy Week, we hold an event that we call our last meal event, and everybody brings a meal that they would want to eat for their last, as long as it's affordable enough. But that meal also involves a breaking of bread, fresh made bread. And we break that bread and we share communion together. It's one of my favorite days of the whole year. But there's always bread left over, usually lots and lots of bread left over. So that's what happened on Thursday. But following that meal, someone came in that was hungry, starving, they said. So we loaded them up with everyone's last meal. But then they saw that fresh baked bread there, the communion bread, and they said, can I have it? And I said, yes, immediately. But then I started thinking, with the Catholic Church, with their view about how communion bread is literally changed into the body of Jesus, would they have allowed this woman to eat, to take that bread to nourish her body? Now, even though that communion service on that day was absolutely beautiful and one that I'll remember forever, which use of communion bread would Jesus have glorified more? The one we shared together, or the one that fed this hungry woman? Let's call it a tie. Jesus concludes his thoughts on gathering food on the Sabbath with another controversial line. Or at least we generally think it's controversial. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And we hear that and we think, whoa, Jesus is changing things about the Sabbath again. Watch out. But here, the actual Sabbath command from Deuteronomy. Get your reading glasses out, Jeff. <laughs> Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, or your son, or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your town, so that your male and female slaves may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You see that last part? Remember that you were a slave. <clears throat> the, the Sabbath is meant to be a reminder that you are no longer a slave. <clears throat> not to your job, not to any person, not even to any set of rules. So when we turn the day into the ultimate rules test, what have we done with the Sabbath? And we think, man, those people had it backwards in Jesus' time. Thank goodness we got past that. Thank goodness we modern people are always good and right and smart and never legalistic. <laughs> da, 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 I'm up. There's a second part to this reading that hits home to the ways that some traditions and some religions do outreach. <coughs> And he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him 
on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then Jesus said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill it? There are feeding programs that will only feed Christians. We have attempted to partner with more than a few churches in Kitsap County that didn't work out because they thought that people needed to be saved according to their tradition uh, before we can even begin to help them in any way. What we can do becomes trapped in what is perceived as a higher need. And don't get me wrong, pastor here, faith is very important. But it's hard to pray lengthy prayers when your stomach is screaming and empty. But that isn't the only way that we trap our religion, our faith. We see people of faith, strong faith, and many times we try to emulate them to do what they do. But we quickly learn we can't live up to that, to them. So we think that we can't do it right, or we are doing it wrong. But what Jesus tries to tell us over and over again is that the right way is the way that connects you to God. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? <clears throat> to save life or to kill? Many times people will say, I don't know how to pray, so I just talk to God. Is that okay? You better believe that's okay. Many times people will say, I've done so many things wrong, I'm too screwed up to be in a church. That's not even close to true. The danger of legalism is that no one, no one measures up. Even Jesus in this section, the perfect one, does not measure up. But when you start with a God that gets that, that died for that. Then we get to lay down that burden and come to a church that is not a place for the perfect, but a place for the infirm. A place where we come to grow in love, forgiveness, fellowship, and faith. Now before we wrap this up, I don't know if you noticed this, or I'd be surprised how many of you did, but there's an oddity in our first reading and our second reading. They don't agree. It seems on a real straightforward way that there's an error. The more I looked at it, the more I started becoming a little bothered by it. I thought, man, should I even mention this? Maybe this will bother people more. But then I started thinking, what if it's intentional? What if there's an error in this section on purpose. Because this is a passage about being anti-legalistic, right? That there's more to the law than just the rules. This passage is how we might not always do everything the perfect way, but God still loves us anyway, right? How would Jesus prove that to us? By being the Son of God, and getting something wrong, and still having it be okay. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel, then I'm going to read from Jesus' summary of 1 Samuel. And you tell me if you notice anything. Did anybody already notice this? Okay. So 1 Samuel 21 says, David came to Nob to the priest Amalek. So that's Samuel 21. Mark 2 says, And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abithar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence. Who's the priest? What's his name? Amalek or Abithar? You could say Mark, the author of the gospel, got the name wrong. 
You could say Jesus is correcting the first Samuel story. You could even go further and say Amalek was just a priest, Abiathar was in charge, and that's what Jesus is talking about. But the more I looked at these two stories sandwiched together, I think Jesus was trying to prove a point. The point of the story is still gotten across, right? Even though we now know that the names are wrong. Even though it's told the wrong way. That is our faith. Don't try to do it the right way. Try to do it the way that works best for you to connect the God that is alive and active in your midst. Jesus regularly tells us to come forward like children, praising children, not because they come forward in the right way. Do any of you think children come forward in the right way? <laughs> Try to stop them from coming forward for the children's sermon. I'd like to see how that goes. I don't even get to tell them now when it is. They just come forward. <laughs> what do children do? They come forward. They ask for what they need. A piece of chalk that's not white. They enjoy what they have most of the time. And they're not so stuck in all that they know that they still have room to grow. Don't let your faith get stuck. Don't let legalism rule. Be like children. Live in God. Love in God. Grow in God. And let go of the rest. Amen.